Dr. Peter Cortez is the founding dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine and professor of pediatrics in molecular virology and microbiology at Baylor College of Medicine, my alma mater. Uh, who's also the director, Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development and Texas Children's Hospital Endowed Chair in Tropical Pediatrics, and the university professor of biology at Baylor College of Medicine. He previously served as the president of the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene and is a founding editor-in-chief of PLOS Neglected Tropical Diseases. He received his BA in Molecular Biophysics and Biochemistry, magna cum laude, uh, Phi Beta Kappa from Yale in 1980, PhD from Rockefeller University, and an MD from Wheel Cornell Medical College in the late 80s. Oh, thank you. Uh, he did a postdoc in Molecular Parasitology and Pediatric Infectious Disease at Yale. School of Medicine, and uh, from 2000 to 2011, he served as a professor and chair of the Department of Microbiology and Tropical Medicine at uh, GW. So I could spend the next 20 minutes listing his awards and prestigious uh, recognition. Suffice it to say um, that they are numerous, uh, and most recently, he's been nominated for the Nobel uh, Peace Prize. Uh, he's going to talk to us today about COVID-19 and uh, the anti-poverty vaccines, the science versus the anti-science. Thank you so very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to try to stand out here if I can. Over the years, I've learned some of my staff can stand behind the podium. All you see is podium, so I think it's better to be out in front of it for more reactive. I think that was a very generous introduction, although you forgot the most important part, which is, uh, I'm a, at least I was, I think I still am, an adjunct professor here. Uh, <laughs> and, part, and partly because I've been collaborating with you all for many, many, many years. In fact, our School of Tropical Medicine that we started at Baylor was modeled on, on here. Um, you, were, you were the inspiration to see if we can create something like this uh, in the Texas uh, Medical Center. And I've known Pierre Bupins for 100 years and Ron Blanton for 100 years before even is Ron here? I don't know if I see him. Uh, I see Eric and I see Claudia as so, you know, a long time collaborators. Mark Klein, who's now, uh, I think, pediatrician in chief, uh, actually recruited me to Baylor College of Medicine. So, so lots of uh, interdigitations and, and links. And so it's a, it's a real uh, honor to, to be back here. And it's, it's especially nice to see people in three dimensions. Uh, not, not not by Zoom, and that that makes it particularly special. So, um, you know, there's that very interesting connection, Houston and New Orleans, anyway. Um, but this is yet another link, and so I'm always happy to hear from you, and you should always feel comfortable emailing me. And um, as I like to say, the anti-vaxxers have my email, so why should you have? The email? <laughs> also, just put at the top who you are, because you can imagine what my inbox looks like in any. On, on any uh, given day. Um, uh, I'm going to kind of give a broad overview of where I, what do I see happening in the global health space and in the vaccine space, uh, and um, show some data from our COVID vaccine, but overall kind of give a 30,000 foot aerial view uh, type lecture. This is the last book I wrote, so I also you know, you don't think of, you know, being in New York and, and New Haven and Washington, D.C., you don't think of moving to Houston, Texas to start writing books. Mm -hmm. um, but that's actually how I think there was something in the fact, you know, in New York or Washington, in New Haven, where everybody writes books, I think there was something liberating about coming to Houston. And all of a sudden, I, this, uh, I have a new book coming out with the working title, Anti-Science Kills. Uh, that will be my fifth book. But this is my last one. And it looks at some of the big picture drivers of, of disease. And so one of the messages that I want to send today is some of those biggest drivers of disease that I found for the book are things that don't necessarily have the biomedical model behind it. Things like poverty and war and political instability, urbanization, deforestation, climate change, people are slowly getting the climate change component of it, but we still don't bring it up into the social sciences. So I think one of the secondary messages of this talk is the more collaboration, because you're part of a full service university with the other campus, think about the opportunities of those collaborations, because these are what are bringing back 
um, disease and actually reversing some of the great gains we've had over the last two decades through the Gavi Alliance, vaccinating the world's children, putting people on anti-malarial drugs and bed nets and antiretroviral drugs and neglected tropical disease drugs. Some of that is being reversed um, right now. And then I'm going to spend a fair bit of time talking about this last one, which I think is among the most virulent and really hitting us now, this, this rise in what I call uh, anti-science. Um, with regards to the book, a lot of it was written before the COVID-19 pandemic, although I finished talking about COVID-19. And it looks at the fact that when these forces operate together, it's not necessarily happening universally, but identifying certain regions of the world where it's really accelerating. For instance, in the Arabian Peninsula, where because of the uh, ISIS occupation, the war in Yemen, we interrupted vaccination program, interrupted Leishman ISIS uh, vector control programs, this big acceleration of disease, exacerbated by the fact that you've got 50 degrees Celsius temperatures, drying up ancient agricultural lands in the Tigris and Euphrates, people fleeing into cities, and that kind of aggressive urbanization is outstripping um, infrastructure, so that in itself is taxing uh, the sewer systems and causing rise in diarrheal pathogen disease and, and also uh, mosquito-borne disease as a consequence. And that instability in itself, some people say well, around water resources was a driver for the political instability. So it all reinforces one another. Or in the Boko Haram areas of, of, of Nigeria, and I know you have a lot of connections in Central Latin America, and you've been seeing this in Venezuela with not only prolonged drought, but also the socioeconomic collapse of the Maduro regime is interrupting uh, vector control programs, vaccination programs, rise of measles, and then measles spilling across the border to the Wayu indigenous people in Colombia, and the Yanomami, and the Brazilian uh, rainforest. And now people sleeping outdoors in the, malaria, in the gold mines, which people are calling the malaria mines because of um, there's, there's been that absence of malaria control. And this is, of course, uh, affecting the entire region. So the book really looks at how things are starting to unravel, where they're unraveling first, and why I think uh, that's going to continue. Um, and now, in this time of, of COVID-19, we're seeing other forces at work. So the official numbers of deaths are around five to six million. We all know that's an underestimate, maybe five to six million deaths in India alone. Maybe the numbers are as high as 20 million globally, according to estimates from the Institute for Health Metrics, The Economist, and others. That's on the right and on the left is a very familiar pattern of deaths from COVID-19 in the United States, beginning with that first wave that hit New York, and then the second one that hit the southern states, including Louisiana and Texas in the summer of 2020, the big alpha wave, and then here's the big delta wave and the Omicron wave. And then I have this big blue arrow here, and this is something I'm going to talk about in more detail. That big blue arrow um, signifies the date May 1st, 2021. That's the date the Biden administration announced that any American who wanted to get a COVID vaccine could get a COVID vaccine, and yet the deaths continued to spiral. That's not what happened in Europe. At that point, most of the deaths were to the left of the blue arrow in the United States. It's not quite equal, but it's a significant number of deaths afterwards because people were defiant of getting vaccinated. People refused to get vaccinated. And, and so this was an unforced error. Uh, and the numbers that I'm coming up with in my new book says that at least in the last half of 2021, during that Delta wave, more than 200,000 Americans gave up their lives because they refused to get vaccinated because of allegiance to this thing. And I'm going to spend some time talking about this thing and why it's such a deadly force and why we have to stop calling it misinformation or disinformation and call it what it is, which is anti-science aggression. That's not becoming a dominant force uh, in, in the United States, particularly in our part of the country um, uh, that we're in. So my major activity is as a vaccine scientist, and in addition to being dean of this tropical medicine school, 
I co-direct with my science partner for the last 20 years, Mary Elena Bacazzi, the Center for Vaccine Development, where we're known now for coronavirus vaccines, but we really set it up mainly for vaccines for parasitic diseases, including schistosomiasis and hookworm and Chagas disease and leishmaniasis. And then about 10 years ago, we started coronavirus vaccines because they were orphaned just like parasitic disease vaccines or people didn't care about coronavirus vaccines that much 10 years ago. So we took on uh, that, that project. And um, our vaccines for parasitic infections, we sometimes call the anti-poverty vaccines because they're vaccines for diseases that not only affect health, but they trap people in poverty because of they affect worker productivity or women's reproductive health or child development and outcomes. And, and so we call them the anti-poverty vaccines. This is actually the first book I wrote um, called Forgotten People, Forgotten Diseases. That's now going into its third edition. My kids used to call it Dad's Forgotten Book. <laughs> forgotten. <laughs> and now it's in its third edition. So I guess it's not too forgotten. All right. And it talks fair, fair about this, so that the work going on in uh, Tulane is, as well. Our, our vaccine program in general tries to use what's called reverse vaccinology. That's, that's our aspirational goal. And this was a concept pioneered by Reno Rapioli out of industry who provided the proof of concept that this is possible with the first vaccine made by reverse vaccinology, which is Vexero, the meningococcal B vaccine. And what Reno's group showed was that he could do in silico prediction of vaccine candidates looking at the genome of Neisseria meningitida serum group B, identify the candidates, do high throughput expression in E. coli, purify those proteins, make a mouse antibody, shows the mouse antibody which ones of these 350 are on the surface of the bacterium, then down select to those who have bactericidal activity to the final product. It's a very elegant approach to making vaccines. So that's, that's always our approach that we attempt. The problem with doing this with complex eukaryotic uh, organisms like parasites is um, it's still a holy grail for us. The, the gene, and the part of the reason is the genomes are massive. Um, you know, if you look at the size of a trypanosome genome or a schistosome genome or a hookworm genome, they're basically the size of the human genome. So there's a lot more data to mine. The bioinformatics is a lot more complicated. And then we have the fact that when we try to do high throughput expression in E. coli and bacterial expression systems, more often than not, we get a barren disulfide bond formation. So you get inclusion bodies that are difficult to solubilize. So you have to go to eukaryotic expression vectors. Sometimes you get lucky with yeast. Other times you have to go to mammalian cells or insect cells. So it becomes a much more complicated process. So it's more, it's not as high throughput as we like, and we have a lot of deficiencies in our, in our animal models. Uh, but we've, we've made some progress. When, what, the other thing that we try to do, the other constraint that we have is because we're not a pharma company, and the traditional multinational pharma companies don't have um, a lot of interest in the kinds of vaccines that we make, we work with this other group who band together what they call themselves as the Developing Country Vaccine Manufacturers Network, the DCVMN. And these are vaccine producers in low and middle income countries that aspire to make new vaccines for disease targets that not necessarily the multinational pharma companies will do. And, and, and the blue balls are where the major ones are, many in India and Indonesia. Um, China, of course, Middle East, Africa, and, and Latin America. And one of the common technologies that they have is they do fermentation in yeast, recombinant protein fermentation in yeast, because that's the way you make the recombinant hepatitis B vaccine. So the countries on the left all make their own recombinant hepatitis B vaccine. So whenever possible, we try to be compatible with that. So our first choice, our workhorse, are these green balls over there, which is uh, Pichia pastoris, which is a <coughs> methanol utilizing yeast. And whenever possible, if we can get a vaccine to go in yeast, we feel really good that there's a good possibility we could then do the tech transfer to vaccine producers in low and middle income countries. So a very different mindset from what you might see from a Moderna or Pfizer, where the idea is they're gonna make a, use a really cool technology that no one else is doing, 
and eventually maybe the crumbs will filter down to the low and middle income countries and that sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. Our approach is to say pharma companies are going to do what the pharma companies do and that's fine. They make huge contributions making vaccines for the Gavi Alliance, but let's broaden the ecosystem to at least so we can kind of short circuit this and start working directly with vaccine producers in low and middle income countries with the technologies that they already have. And we've done this now for um, vaccines for hookworm infection and schistosomiasis, um, which in the past when I've come here, I've spoken only about that. Um, these vaccines are now in uh, phase two clinical trials in Brazil and in sub-Saharan Africa. And with, with Eric and Claudia, we've been working, of course, on a Chagas disease vaccine led by Catherine Jones in our group. And here, this is more of a therapeutic vaccine. The idea is that uh, one of the antigens that uh, Eric identified, uh, TC24, is a DNA vaccine. We're trying to scale it up as a protein vaccine that's been modified so it doesn't aggregate. So we do a lot of things like uh, modify the proteins in order to make them uh, easier to scale up and produce. And then with GLA, a glucoparinacid lipid A, so uh, adjuvant access is always a problem for us and we try to get adjuvants that are more open access. We've been able to show, as is Eric in his, his DNA vaccine experiments and now protein, that we can do this um, by um, in, 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 in laboratory animals that ordinarily would have progression of cardiac disease due to the presence of the trypanosome in the heart producing fibrotic deposition, the vaccine seemed to halt the fibrotic deposition and, and the inflammation, especially if given a loss on chemotherapy. So this vaccine will go into phase one clinical trials in, in Mexico with a consortium of Mexico institution, Mexican institutions uh, next year. And then we've been turning our attention to COVID vaccinations. And this is the equity map that everybody has seen by now, the fact that we've largely failed to vaccinate the African continent uh, and, and South Asia, Southeast Asia, and parts of Central America. And this is the a reason why the Delta variant arose out of an unvaccinated population out of India last year, Omicron and its subvariants out of unvaccinated populations in Southern Africa because there was not sufficient attention <coughs> to this. And so, um, you know, our, our premise is that there was so much emphasis on speed and innovation, and we got some very interesting vaccines, RNA vaccines and uh, DNA vaccines, even particle vaccines, uh, adenovirus vectored vaccines. And it clearly advanced the whole field of vaccine science, but there was not enough attention to working with the DCVMN like we were doing, and, and that's what we worked on. So we uh, made a recombinant uh, protein vaccine via Pichia fermentation and yeast. We had done this with SARS, and we did it with SARS-2, the receptor binding domain, on alum together with the CPG oligonucleotide, and now um, then licensed it with no patent to India, Indonesia, Bangladesh, and Botswana. India has gone the furthest, uh, where they actually, we transfer the ownership. So they own the vaccine, they work out the clinical trial plan and the data dissemination with their own regulators in India, as well as the DCGI. And Corbivax, uh, named after biological E, is the vaccine that's now gone 70 million doses, has been administered now to adolescents 12 to 14. And we just got the green light today. We heard that it'll be given as a booster for adults who've gotten either Covishield, which is the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine made in India, or um, Covaxin, which is the inactivated virus. So um, another 100 million doses have been shipped. Um, <clears throat> the amazing thing is we did this on a, four, a $400,000 R56 from the NIH, because we, we had an R01 for SARS, and then we were looking to how we can get NIH funding. Some of our, our program officer at the NIH figured out a way to get us $400,000 through an R56 mechanism. And then CEPI provided about $13 million um, to Biological E. So I think we were told, I was at the White House Vaccine Summit, I was told we broke all records for number of doses administered per public investment of funds. I mean, an R56, $400,000. <laughs> 13 million of CEPI support, 
Um, you know, as it was something like Novavax, which has administered one million doses so far, they received one point four billion dollars, I think, from the federal government and another four hundred million from CEPI at two thousand dollars a dose. So, so thirty cents a dose versus uh, two thousand dollars a dose. And the vaccine, again, old school receptor binding domain of the spike protein, not the whole spike protein, just the RBD on aluminum hydroxide together with the CPG TLR9 agonist from uh, the Dynavax uh, Corporation and showed it was highly effective in non-human primates, induced virus neutralizing the antibodies, low cost in India, it's being made for um, 145 rupees a dose. Anybody want to say what that is in US dollars? 145 rupees. It's about a dollar ninety a dose. So mm. I think one of the lowest cost vaccines. And and so the kinds of things that we would do in our lab, if you go to our lab meetings, um, you know, a lot of what we do are kind of a hybrid between um, an academic lab and kind of a, a biotech. And so a kind of this would be a typical slide in our lab meeting where we would labor about how we express the protein without the N-terminal asparagine, because that was heavily glycosylated, which can interfere with immunogenicity. Or express the protein without a cysteine, because that was causing intermolecular disulfide bond formation. And you know the, the problem that we faced early on in the pandemic is CEPI would come to us, or the uh, and I, even the NIH, or even our operation work speed and said, hey, this is not very innovative. And they're right, it's not that very innovative, but it works and you can make a bucket of it at, at low cost. That was always the frustration. I think we were so full tilt on the coolness and the innovation factor that I think we kind of lost um, our, our sight on things. And then what we do is we'll actually do the scale up process development in the lab, and this is also a differentiator from a typical academic lab. We do this under a quality umbrella, quality control, quality assurance, showing that we could do this at the 5, 10, or 20 liter fermentation scale the same way every time and have a battery of assays that each batch of the vaccine that we make, we show that it's subjected to um, quality control. And then we need a proof of concept that it actually worked as a vaccine. We wound up doing two non-human primate trials, one on alum with CPG and the other one on alum with another adjuvant that we had access to, which is the 3MO52 adjuvant, a TLR7 agonist from what used to be called IDRI, now they're called AHI, A-A-H-I. I always forget what the new acronym stands for. It used to be the Infectious Disease Research Institute in Seattle. So Siduri Kasturi, Siduri Kasturi led the Not Human Primate um, at, at Emory, the Not Human Primate Center, and showed that we can you know, stop virus replication in the lungs as measured by virus in Bronco alveolar lavage fluid upon challenge. And even uh, from the nasal swab and throat swab, you might get one or two of the non-human primates with some virus, but that was also true of mRNA and adenovirus vector vaccines. And, and the lungs looked terrific, they're really low pathology scores. So we knew early on that we were um, had a pretty exciting um, vaccine um, that we could technology transfer. And so it, by this time, this was in 2020, we were getting frantic phone calls from ministers of science, ministers of health, from low and middle income countries because they realized the mRNA vaccines weren't coming and the other and the particle vaccines weren't coming and what can we do? And so we decided to do this with no patent and transfer the technology so we would send the production cell bank to the LMIC producer um, with instructions for scale up and assays and then we would go on regular Zoom calls with them every week to help them with the uh, assay development and um, these four got the furthest, India, Indonesia, Bangladesh, and South Africa. Indonesia is kind of an interesting one because, because the Pichia pastoris doesn't use any animal protein or human protein or animal <coughs> cells or human cells. It's a vegan technology. And therefore, it's halal, could be halal. So this will be, they're now, uh, they've now, I think they've finished now halal certification um, for, for the vaccine. So that's. That's something I not, didn't really think of at the time, but that's another exciting advantage. Um, Corvivax uh, in India, the emergency use authorization happened towards the end of uh, last year. 
um, in phase one trials, the first round of trials were not as immunogenic as we'd like. We had to up the amount of CPG to uh, 750 micrograms, which is still less than some of the other vaccines that use CPG, like the one from Clover, I think uses 1,500 uh, micrograms. So that was fine. And then um, the, the Indian regulators asked them to do an immunobridging study, um, a superiority study with the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is made by the Serum Institute of India, where it's known as Covishield. And we showed that the level of virus neutralizing the antibody was getting up there with uh, mRNA. And uh, in a superiority study showed it was superior, not only in terms of virus neutralizing the antibody against the original variants, but also uh, the uh, Delta strain, the Beta strain, Omicron strain. So it was on that basis um, that it was uh, authorized. And in terms of cellular responses, here's Corby, Corbivax, here's Covishield, some superior cellular responses uh, as well. And um, so the first kids were vaccinated on March 15th, and now we're up to 70 million. Now we've got the green light um, for the adults. The way the uh, app works in India, your vaccine has to be registered on what's called this COVID app. And that's the game changer in terms of whether people can actually get the vaccine. So this is now happening with, with adults. Uh, as well. And then, very interestingly, um, la in 2020, we got visited by um, the president of Botswana, who um, aspires to make Botswana a hub of innovation for Africa. He'll come to see me specifically, and we get all these leaders from foreign leaders of countries that come from the oil and gas industry in Houston. And every now and then, some will make a side trip to the Texas Medical Center. And that's, what, <laughs> that's what happened in this one. And then we had dinner with him. And now uh, Corbivax has been transferred to uh, Botswana, where it's been approved. And the hope is that they can now scale up production of, of Corbivax as, as well. So hoping to build that innovation in, in Africa at the same time. Now, at the same time, I have this other hat, in part because uh, I've been fighting with the anti-vaccine people for many, many years because I have um, four adult kids, including Rachel, who has autism and intellectual disabilities. And a few years ago, I wrote a book called Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism, which kind of made me public enemy number one or two with um, the anti-vaccine groups. RFK Jr. on his Instagram uh, labeled me the OG villain, which which I had to look up uh, the original uh, gangster villain. So Dr. Bitch even invited the original gangster villain to come and speak at uh, too late too late to the end. And so the so but this had the advantage of making me not only an expert in vaccine science but vaccine anti science. And so I've been able to kind of watch the evolution or de evolution of this movement over time. And and that's how I'd like to end kind of taking you through that and then leave a fair bit of time for, for a Q&A. And, and this is how I see it, that the, it's gone through different versions and waves, or what I call version 1.0, version 2.0, version 3.0, and, and kind of and taking you through the, the different versions. So version 1.0 claimed that vaccines cause autism, and then for reasons I'll explain, about seven, eight years ago, it took a pivot. It became more of a political movement on the far right under this banner of health freedom, medical freedom. And now it's, it's begun to globalize. And, and now we're seeing this whole anti-vaccine empire reach low and middle income countries as well. So let's go through 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. So even with 1.0, there's some complexity there because the anti-vaccine groups keep moving the goalpost on what they really mean by vaccines causing autism. So it started out with a, a paper that was published in The Lancet in 1998 by Andrew Wakefield and his colleagues claiming that the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, which was a live virus vaccine, had the ability to replicate in the colon. And somehow that led to autism, or at that time they called it pervasive developmental disorder. But the scientific community responded in, in a big time way, showing that kids who got the MMR vaccine were no more likely to become autistic than kids who didn't. And similarly, kids on the autism spectrum were no more likely to have gotten MMR than kids not. And that really, I think, deep six the MMR idea. But as over time, the anti-vaccine groups would become stronger, uh, more powerful, greater bandwidth, uh, greater funding, 
So they weren't going to fold the tent after that. And, and what, instead, what they did is they kept on switching up what the actual assertion was. That's what I mean by moving the goalposts. As soon as you thought you had them, something new came along. So then it was thimerosal preservative that used to be in vaccines, which was taken out. And then, and, and, and again, large cohort study showing no link. But again, not taking no for an answer. Then it was spacing vaccines too close together. And then you had Jenny McCarthy and, and her husband saying, no, we have to green the vaccines by spacing them out. There's all BS. There's nothing, nothing true about it. And then it was Alleman vaccines. And then for a while, they even pivoted away from autism, although that threat still continues today. And they said it was the HPV vaccine um, for human papillomavirus vaccines causing infertility and autoimmunity. How many people have heard COVID-19 vaccines cause infertility? Yeah, that's where they got it from. They just copy-pasted the big assertion for HPV and then copy-pasted it onto, onto COVID-19 vaccines. And, and this is how I got involved. That's me with, with Rachel um, and wrote the book, which kind of goes into details explaining the evidence showing there's no link between vaccines and autism, and also what autism is and how it begins in early fetal brain development. Uh, now more than 100 autism genes have been identified, a lot of them by the Broad Institute at Harvard and MIT. Many of them are involved in neuronal communication. Um, uh, a lot of them are neuronal cytoskeleton genes. And when we did whole exome sequence, genomic sequencing, and Rachel and my wife Ann and I, we found that Rachel had a mutation in a non-red cell spectrum, a neuronal spectrum gene. So that's actually a new autism gene, but similar to the others. That was actually written up in the American Journal of uh, Medical Genetics. And um, you can imagine what the anti-vaccine groups thought of all of that. And, and because essentially what I'm doing is interfering with our bottom line, because what these anti-vaccine groups are doing is they're monetizing, they're monetizing the internet, right? They're selling fake nutritional supplements. Um, I mean, if you go to Amazon.com and you type in books on vaccinations, it's a horror show, right? I mean, like my pro-vaccine books are among the higher rated pro-vaccine books, but I think the highest one's number 35, because they're preceded by 34 phony anti-vaccine books, you know, how to raise a vaccine despite your pediatrician, how to vaccinate your child despite your pediatrician, how to vaccinate your child despite your pediatrician, how to raise a child without vaccines, you know, then they drift into the COVID conspiracy um, books. And so there's a, so Amazon is the largest purveyor of fake anti-vaccine uh, COVID conspiracy books, and also um, monitor, uh, fake autism cures chelation therapies, a lot of them are actually quite harmful uh, and, and dangerous stuff, but it's lucrative and it, it raises a lot of money. So the fact that I'm interfering with their bottom line uh, made me uh, a big, big public enemy. But I think it had some impact in diffusing it. The problem was um, it, they reacted in a way which I probably should have anticipated but didn't. And it goes something like this. So by the 2010s, so many kids in California were being opted out of getting vaccinated by their parents. But guess what? There was a big measles epidemic in Southern California, 2014, 2015. No surprise there. And the California legislature responded appropriately. And they said, from now on, if you, kids are going to attend school, they have to be vaccinated. And I think that was the right thing to do, and I supported it. But it had a backlash, and the backlash was, hey, you can't tell our kids, parents what to do. And this really ignited this concept of health freedom or medical freedom, freedom li uh, linked to libertarian politics. And that became version 2.0. And unfortunately, it found a new home in Texas, and where I am. And this is where it really um, ex accelerated. So we were at more than. Um, by, by two years ago, before the pandemic, more than 70,000 kids denied access to one or more vaccines. Now it's up to, I think, like something like 90,000. And those are the ones we know about. There are 300,000 homeschooled kids in the state of Texas. How many of them are not vaccinated? Anybody want to guess? Close to 100%. We don't know. They're homeschooled, right? So <laughs> we, have, we have no idea. So the numbers are easily over 100,000, maybe 200,000. Not so bad in Houston, but the suburbs of Austin, um, some of the North Texas counties, Plano, Denton, really bad um, in, in terms of that. And 
And this then is what accelerated as a national trend under this banner of health freedom. So you had a political action committee form to lobby the state legislature, Texans for Vaccine Choice, um, the Texas Freedom Caucus. You had all the podcasters down in Austin. Joe Rogan's in Austin, right? Alex Jones is in Austin. Um, and, and soon it became not only protests against um, vaccines, but social distancing, contact tracing, and masks. And, and that's what we're dealing with right now. So it is a, first and foremost, a political enterprise linked to um, the far right. And so, for instance, uh, in Texas, this is a vaccination map of Texas for COVID-19 vaccines. The higher rates of vaccination very much correspond to the blue counties, meaning Democratic strongholds, or in the urban areas, the Texas Triangle, whereas in you know central Texas, the Panhandle, East Texas, has some of the lowest vaccination rates in the country. So Texas, as it overall is in the bottom tier of states vaccinating, it's not too, too terrible, but it's biphasic. You're either in the urban areas and along the border, which have pretty good vaccination rates, or no one's getting vaccinated in, in, in the rest of the state. And this has been reflected nationally now. So Charles Gabba, the health analyst, has looked at this. Um, New York Times, Axios, uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation, the Pew Research Center, um, have all done the same kind of analysis. And it shows the following, that um, after that blue bar, which was here, May 1, overwhelmingly those who lost their lives from COVID were in red states and because they refused to get vaccinated. And the redder the county as, as a surrogate measurement, Trump voters in the 2020 election, the greater the loss of life. And so much so that the New York Times labeled it red COVID. And, and so I think one of the, I know we're gonna have a QA, and a and I'm gonna start out with a question to you in the Q&A is, how do we talk about this? Because, you know, all of our training as scientists or as academics said, you know, we're not really supposed to talk about Republicans and Democrats or liberals or conservatives. We're supposed to be politically neutral. Um, we're, um, you know, at best, this is impolite. At worst, this looks like we have a political agenda. But what do you do when people are refusing to get vaccinated, losing their lives? It's strictly along a partisan divide. And it's so glaring. And, and we know why. We know why because at the CPAC conference, they said first they're going to vaccinate you, and then they're going to take away your guns and your, and your Bibles. And as ridiculous as that sounds to us, a quarter of the country accepted that. Or, you know, vaccines are political instruments of control. Or Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene out of Georgia um, calls people who vaccinate you medical brown shirts using the Nazi paramilitary analogy. And of course, it's amplified every night on Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram on Fox News. And um, if, you know, it's a horror show when you turn that on. And, and of course, they go after Fauci, they go after Tony. And then when they get tired of going after Tony, they go after me. And, um, and then, you know, the barrage of, of hate email I get after that, or if you ever follow what's on Twitter, it really amplifies when they profile me on Fox News. Um, and and the, also the interesting thing is, is the language used in the threats. It says, the army of patriots is coming to hunt me down. Um, that, that's the common refrain. To which I say, you know, why didn't an army of patriots? It's just me and Anne and Rachel and the cat. I, mean, I think one patriot, you know, maybe two patriots. But, you know, this, this is, and it's all very much um, that kind of rhetoric. They know I'm Jewish, so there's a lot of anti-Semitism. Uh, linked to it's very, taking this very dark turns. You have to involve the Houston Police Department and, and the Anti-Defamation League. Whenever I give a talk, I have to notify you to you know, have security on hand. Most of the time it's fine, but every now and then weird stuff starts to happen. So, so you have to be ready for it. But this has become kind of our, our, our new normal, and it's globalizing. So you saw this with the Freedom Convoy protests um, in Canada and very much egged on by the Fox News anchors and members of the House Freedom Caucus of the US Congress. It's now in Western Europe. So if you, and the point is, it's that same type of um, rhetoric used by the far right in the US around freedom and around patriots. Um, and, and now, uh, I'm 
starting to see this become uh, go, go global. So this is a new article that just came out in Nature Reviews in Immunology, which so you know every country has some degree of anti-vaccine stuff now, but you know it usually differs country by country. The game changer that I'm seeing now is that U.S. style rhetoric and the me and the Fauci memes and the Tucker Carlson stuff is now expanding to low and middle income countries. And I think and in this paper, I try to cite examples of how that US style rhetoric is affecting low and middle income countries to the point where I'm worried that they're not going to stop at COVID-19 vaccines. Certainly that they're not in the US. We already have the polls showing that in the Republican stronghold areas, people are not vaccinating their kids at the same rate um, that they are in, in other parts of the country. That same kind of partisan divide now it could spill over to U.S. pediatric vaccination rates for, you know, measles, pertussis, and polio, and haemophilus, influenza type B, but not globally as well. And so the worry is all those successes we've had the last two decades after the Millennium Development Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals, the Gavi Alliance, I worry about that further unraveling uh, because of this. And, and so you say, okay, Dr. Hotez, what are you going to do about it? And the answer is, I don't know. Because I don't think the health sector knows what to do either, because it's not, it's a political problem. So I've said, I don't know what to do, but there are people who do. And maybe we need to bring together the experts and people who fight things like global terrorism or nuclear proliferation or cyber attacks. Um, and just take that same lens and apply it to the anti-science, anti-vaccine movement. Because quite honestly, you know, political, te global terrorism, nuclear proliferation or cyber attacks, that never killed 200,000 Americans. This is a far more lethal and potent force than any of those other things. And yet we don't frame it uh, as that. And it's been an ongoing struggle even with the Department of Health and Human Services. I mean, when I, in 2017, I wrote an op-ed piece called How the End, which the New York, you don't get the right title if you write an op-ed piece from the New York Times. The editor selects it. It wasn't the greatest title, but it, he, the title was How the Anti-Vaxxers Are Winning. But, you know, I basically, you know, predicted a lot of the stuff that was going to happen. The next day, I get a call from Health and Human Services, and the way the Zoom call started was, it said, they said, Peter, we're not mad. <laughs> you know what that means, right? They're mad as all hell, right? And, and, okay, why are they mad? They said, Peter, we're not talking about this now because you're going to give it oxygen. You're going to call attention to it. I said, this has got all the attention it needs. And, you know, I basically, you know, it was a very frank exchange. I said, you've got to stop thinking about the American people like everyone's got a compact computer and dial-up modem and uses Ask Jeeves as your search engine. <laughs> the world has moved on, and, and this thing is accelerating. So finally, Vivek Murthy, our surgeon, who's a very good surgeon general, has you know, issued an alert um, um, a few months ago, very much focused on the social media companies, you know, Facebook and, or whatever they're called, now, Meta, and, and Instagram and said, you know, we've got to work with them to switch up the computer algorithms. And I get that, and that, yes, that's useful, but it doesn't get to those generating the content. And, and that's where I think we need to move to, and I don't know how you do that, especially within a legal framework, but there are experts who do. So uh, let me stop there, and happy to take questions. I'm in, I'm in your hands. Wonderful. so much for coming, Dr. Hotez. It's great to hear from you, your perspectives on this. I heard a little piece on the news this morning about a uh, vaccine production facility in South Africa actually shutting down COVID vaccine production. Is that something you're concerned about as well with everything that's going on, that even some of the places? Yeah, so Aspen, we talked to them as well. Aspen was set up, um, I believe, to make I don't know if it was, it was adenovirus vectored vaccines or, or mRNA vaccines and others. And now the vaccine doses are going unused. And I think there's a few forces at work. I think part of it is a lot of resentment because, you know, when, when low LMICs were denied mRNA vaccines 
early on that built up a lot of resentment. Now they're finally here, and so many people have already been infected with COVID. I still think they should get vaccinated. But so I think that's at work, but also the fact that now you're starting to see the um, spillover of the US anti vaccine movement. So, for instance, one of the anti vaccine groups has now made a movie. Um, they make, they've made several movies. This latest one, which is called Infertility, alleges that the World Health Organization deliberately spiked tetanus toxoid, TDAP, tetanus toxoid vaccine to give to pregnant women with human chorionic gonadotropin so you could render those women infertile for subsequent uh, pregnancies. Um, and that's circulating all over Africa, as are films that are quite um, the Pfizer vaccination and the Moderna vaccination with Tuskegee experimentation. All right, so this is this this is deliberate targeting, and I also think that's a factor. And you know, people ask me about, well, like Dr. Hodges, you can talk about the um, um, vaccine hesitancy in black and brown communities. You know, and people talk about historic distrust, and I, and I get that. But you know, historically, the African American and Hispanic communities have not been anti-vaccine. This is newer. And I believe a component of it has been deliberate targeting by anti-vaccine groups. So they held this Harlem vaccine forum before the pandemic, um, which alleges all, all, all sorts of uh, crazy things. And I think that we don't really talk enough about that, but that's having an effect as well. So you didn't touch on, so, so when I first moved here, there was an 11-year-old who developed type 1 diabetes outside of Baton Rouge. And the parents prayed for her, and she wound up dying. Um, they prosecuted the parents, and they, well, they thought about prosecuting, they never prosecuted the parents. Um, you know, I guess freedom of religion, right? Uh, that out trumped the rights of the 11 year old <laughs> to live to adulthood. Um, so, you know, the people that may have the greatest risk of the anti science are the unprotected, the, 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 the people that don't have autonomy, right? The, the uh, children. And a lot of this vaccine misinformation, I think, is also spread in our evangelical community. Yeah. And so, yeah. so, so how do you tackle those two issues? So, the, so, and this is something I'm trying to look at in my book, and I, I don't have the answer. I, you know, first of all, none of the major religions are against vaccines, right? There's nothing in Islam that's against vaccines, and yet the Taliban are assassinating polio workers in Pakistan and, and Afghanistan. Um, and same with there's nothing about Christianity or Catholicism that's against vaccines. The Pope has been very proactive talking about the importance of getting vaccinated. But with the Christian evangelicals, and it's not, and again, it's not a monolith, it, it's not a speak with one voice. There's a component, I think, that just so identifies with that far right element that they may use principles around this, but it's really not about religion per se. Yes. So um, it's anti-science, anti-vaxxers, but they're, they're operating at another level, which is it's really anti-government. And, and I mean, that seems like a monumental problem. Yeah, no, it's, I, you're I, absolutely right. I mean, so for instance, when I brought this up at the White House, you know, talking about the anti-science movement, I mean, the answer was, well, you know, join the club because you know, it's not just anti-science, it's, you know, it's not believing in the 2020 election results and, and everything else. And I said the difference, though, is, you know, this is a nation built on science and technology, right? This is a nation built on our research universities and institutions. And it's not just targeting the science, it's targeting the scientists. And, you know, Dr. Gary and I have been talking about about this and you know it's not only around vaccines it's these phony ideas that the virus was engineered uh, in a lab because of an NIAID grant it's all BS and yet you know so and now they're using this as an excuse to target individual scientists not only around vaccines but the phony gain of function stuff um, the climate scientists have been dealing with this for a few years now and what they've done is they've created something called the Climate Defense Fund, Climate Science Defense Fund, because you know the, her level of harassment is only accelerating. I mean, it's not only the angry emails, but they use this thing called legal thuggery, 
where they're always threatening you with legal actions. And what do you do when you get a letter on legal stationery, right? So, you know, University Council, General Council will back you. And they've been very good. Baylor has been very good with me, but not all universities will do that. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, and if the thing I worry about is if both houses flip to the Republicans, you know, and then, then who knows, Ron DeSantis, who's gone after me a few times to become president, who knows what's going to happen. So I really worry about an extended war on science and scientists. Mm -hmm. and I think that's, we've got to figure out a way to preempt that. Again, this is not fun to talk about, right? Because the truth is I'm not a politically very inclined person. I'm a very, you know, you know I came to Texas 12 years ago and I uh, got to know people like Jim Baker and you know, I didn't always agree with him, but I never doubted Jim Baker's, you know, commitment to the country and patriotism. It's what's happening now are not old school Texas Republicans. This is something kind of new and twisted and cult like that is extremely dangerous. So, uh, thanks, Peter. I was really, really fascinating. Um, I was intrigued by your comment about the anti vaxxer movement moving to LMICs, uh, which is very different from my experience in Peru is uh, there, there are vaccine controversies, but uh, it's, it's desperation for vaccines. Yeah, yeah. so Latin that. America has been somewhat insulated. And, and, and I've, I addressed recently the Texas Children's has a relationship with some of the Latin American pediatric societies, and they hold a big meeting in Colombia. And, and I asked the question, you guys so far have been relatively insulated from that you know, compared to the African countries and the Asian countries. And, and I think they've just been, the pediatric societies have just been very strong and vocal and seem to, so far, being able to draw a line in the sand or a firewall to it. So I think you're right. I think Latin America, it hasn't really contaminated Latin America yet, except I think for Brazil, we're starting to see that with, with Bolsonaro, who has that same kind of sort of far-right authoritarian mentality discrediting COVID vaccinations and I so I do worry about a country like Brazil. So do you think there's any connection with sort of the the the, the controversies on colonialism and global health is uh, is there any is it becoming wrapped up in, in those I think so I think you know there's you know there's there was clearly a colonial element to vaccine equity right in the first two years of the pandemic and so yes I think that's that's probably a component as well. Amazing lecture thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us I'm so curious about what you think the central mechanism is for the anti-vaxxer and anti-science movement you know I've always thought it's fear-based that leads people to reject science and reject sort of um, uh, knowledge that's presented before them and um, I'm not sure if there's one central answer, you know, but um, given everything that you've seen so far, is there any thought to what you might think um, might be underlying all of it? You know, it's, it's very politically motivated for some, but... Yeah, it's, and it's changed. I think, you know, you know, the people who weren't, you know, really on pre-pandemic parents who weren't vaccinating their kids, I would have said these parents are victims, right? They're victims of the disinformation that dominates the internet from, uh, and then the Center for Countering Digital Hate. It's amazing we have to have an organization called the Center for Countering Digital Hate. Identified 12 organizations <coughs> that, um, NGOs that were responsible for about two thirds of the disinformation on the internet. And in those cases, and, and I'd be curious to hear from the pediatricians here, you generally could have a conversation with the parent kind of walk them back to rationality, get them to vaccinate their kids. Now it's changed. It's changed because of this political affiliation, this allegiance. I mean, I can, I wrote a couple of articles, one for eClinical Medicine, another for the Washington Post, that listed the 12 talking points people gave for not getting a COVID vaccine, ranging from the seemingly plausible that um, they were rushed, not adequately tested for safety, which you could explain to the crazy stuff, right? That vaccines have chips and magnets, and you have the person at the Ohio legislature stick bobby pins and keys on her forehead, saying how they stuck it before. And of course, they fell right off. But, but, and, but the point is, even when you go through that canon of lists, that list, 
people still aren't getting vaccinated. So they may initially give you certain reasons, but ultimately they're going to say, I'm, critical th I'm a critical thinker. Anyone says they're a critical thinker, they are not a critical <laughs> Aaron Rodgers says he's a critical thinker. He's not a critical thinker, um, and and um, and but it's really about belonging to this thing, this allegiance to this thing. About you know, we, you know, we don't have the right words. Some people call it the GOP. Some people call it the New Right. There's another term, middle middle American radicals. There's all sorts of new terms coming out. But you know what I'm talking about is allegiance to this thing. That's the reason why they're not getting vaccinated and that's much tougher because you know how do you do that so there's a uh, there's a, a Valerie Rain as a, a science communication specialist at Cornell in Ithaca and she writes about the importance of you know appealing to people's core values that you can give them all the facts you want but if you don't appeal to their core values you're not going to hit them and I think that's part of it what we need one of the answers, I think, is to create more champions from those groups who are willing to publicly endorse vaccine. But you see, even when, when President Trump got up there at a rally and talked about getting vaccinated, he was booed. So, you know, I think it's a mistake to just say this is all about Trump. This is way beyond Trump. This is something bigger and darker now. Um, yes? So, how would you um, address the fact that uh, anti science started with science? For example, you mentioned uh, in the beginning uh, in autism, the paper announced but it's also the case uh, for anti-climate uh, uh, science, start with scientific, that uh, very small, even if they are a small portion, their, their, voice, their, their voice are very loud. Uh, for yes, example, I, think, I think that's a very good point, um, and I'm glad you brought it up because I didn't mention it. So the other piece to this besides the House Freedom Caucus and Senator Rand Paul and Senator Johnson and, and Fox News are what I call the third pillar of that are the contrarian intellectuals or pseudo-intellectuals. And some of them are coming from far-right think tanks um, like the Hoover Institution at Stanford, but a lot, uh, several of them are prominent medical school professors at places like Stanford and Johns Hopkins and UCSF. And that's really tough, right? Because they are smart, right? And they use facts, real facts and real factoids, but it's strung together in a way to create a false narrative. And that's really tough to go up against. Moreover, they're very aggressive. And, you know, and what they do is they publicly criticize me and they say, who is this guy, right? I mean, what makes him the authority? We're just asking questions. That's the scientific method. He's not being a scientist. There's even a, an article on the Cato Institute website called "Science, science is not the scientists are, is not the priesthood," right? And so they're basically trying to make the case that when I get up there and say, you know, vaccines are safe or don't cause autism and don't uh, magnetize you and that sort of stuff, you know, this I'm the one who's not acting like the scientist. They're the ones acting like the scientists. That's very clever in a, in a very diabolical way, and not easy to not, not easy to navigate that space. Yes. Um, taking off of the fact point, I was just intrigued, and, I, and when I was looking at your slides, you talked about the red, what you call it, the red counties or whatever, and it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. Can't you focus on all the death that's occurring in those counties and speak to those people in real? They must realize it. Just it just amazes. Yeah, me. I mean, there's a section in my new book that talks about there are about seven or eight um, very popular conservative radio talk show hosts that you know railed against vaccines, railed against Fauci and me, and um, ultimately lost their lives from COVID. And, and what's interesting is what's happened as they lay dying. Some were defiant <coughs> to the end, saying this is still a hoax, not, and they're not even dying with dignity. Their last words are this is still a hoax. Or they you know, recant and tell their friends to get vaccinated. Um, uh, but it's either way, it's a human tragedy, right? That, that this is uh, 
and, and the toll it's taken on ICU nurses across the country, taking care of patient after patient who refuse to get vaccinated. And so I've said to the Biden administration, maybe you could create an ambassador's program and I'll serve as the Texas ambassador, or one of the, you know, to, to really reach out with the governors. And, uh, and um, it's, but, you know, the, I think part of it is they, rec they recognize it, um, but if they're gonna reach across the aisle, they're not gonna spend it on this stuff. They're gonna spend it on, you know, buy back better, build back better, and, and all the other stuff. It's stopped, hasn't risen to the top. And this is what I say. I say it's, you know, not that I'm trying to change people's conservative views or even, even your extreme political view. Now you have the Proud Boys, for instance, marching the anti-vaccine rallies and the Oath Keepers. I say, you're entitled to your conservative views, but don't adopt this one. You know, some of wall off. Don't take this. This is going to kill you. And, and, but it's very tough. Yes? I'm a, I'm like a young rising clinician, I'm in training, um, and I'm an aspiring pediatrician, and I find myself sometimes getting, feeling kind of hopeless with just the amount of anti-science, you know, climate change, environmental racism, I, it, it, can, it can easily feel like I get bogged down in that. How do you maintain hope? Yeah, and you know, and oftentimes, you know, the the medical students or residents of Baylor will look at me like I'm Moses in the desert. Why did you, why did you bring us here? You know? so, I say, look, I mean, sure, you could be at Harvard or Penn or Boston Children's Hospital and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, where everybody agrees with you, or you can be down here and make a diff try to make a difference. And I think that's one of the things, you know, try to. You know, see what the levers you can pull and push at the policy and advocacy level. Not that I really offer much of a roadmap for it, but at least you know you're you're fighting the good fight. Down. Yes. Uh, so I just have a question about. Um, I remember early when the vaccine first came out, I was seeing in the news about how there are places in like the deep south, super red zone, where there are vaccine thousands hundreds of thousands of vaccines being just purely wasted versus um, other countries who are not as affluent as the United States is, is dying, waiting for these vaccines. So I'm just wondering um, if you think this kind of anti-vaccine, anti-science and scientific aggression is just a phenomenon of people um, taking everything that we have for granted and they're just they have nothing to do, nothing else to do. Um, yeah, no, I think there's, there's a, there is a component of that, but I think it's darker than that now. I think, as I say, I think these, I think of these individuals as victims, victims of um, what we used to call misinformation or disinformation, and now I call it an anti-science political ecosystem um, that is now becoming more and more deeply entrenched it's got money, it's got organization, it's got political power, it's got political action committees that take other PAC money. And it's not, you know, and it's not like as COVID begins to dissipate in the next year or two, they're gonna say, okay, let's fold the tent and go home. They're, they're emboldened now, and they're going to target um, certainly all vaccines, all pediatric vaccines, uh, he, both in the US and globally, they're going to extend to other realms of biomedical science. And we've already seen how they're attacking the virologists over COVID origins. I don't know where this goes. Do they go after CRISPR-Cas9 technology? Do they go after gene editing, RNA-seq? Who knows what, what's next? But it's, it's a much larger war on biomedical science that I see evolve. Yes? I, sorry, I actually have a follow-up question about all of that. Do you see, as far as making, promoting health equity and all that, do you see the scientific field um, moving towards where making vaccines are much more easily accessible and easier to ship to other words, other parts of the world where people are welcoming the science? And well, well, certainly we're, we're trying to do that. On the other hand, you know, look what's already happening with monkeypox vaccines, right? Mm -hmm. it's like, it's like deja vu all over again, right? We're you know we're hoarding monkeypox vaccine like there's there's no tomorrow, and um, so so you, and you would think any of the lessons it doesn't look to me like any of the lessons learned with COVID nineteen are, are being applied 
um, with our next big challenge, which is the monkey pox next. Yes? Once again, I was wondering whether you take any hope from the recent uh, findings against Alex Jones, for example, <laughs> with regard to the Sandy Hook statements that he's made, and whether that's a strategy that might work to tackle some of the major actors regarding anti-science and anti-vaccine, arguing for people who have, you know, a child who has been damaged or harmed because the, the school yeah, I mean, had I've, vaccination. I've said, you know, the Department of Justice, you know, needs to get involved, you know, that, and these 200,000 American lives lost are not by accident, and, you know, do we need a, a version of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission or something to really understand what's going on? And you can imagine what they say about me on Twitter uh, uh, <laughs> uh, a, 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 after that, right? So, um, um, uh, so, and and that just steps up the attacks uh, e even more uh, because then it, then it looks like vigilanteism. So, you know, threading the needle is really tough. Yeah. But civil versus criminal might be a way to get at the money. Yeah, it could be could be, but it's so far, you know, no one's been willing, you know, the Center for Countering Digital Hate has been pushing for deplatforming some of the worst uh, offenders, and it happens in bits and pieces, but not at the level that's needed. And again, it's not just that disinformation doesn't anymore, it's, it's bigger than that, and now it's this whole far-right authoritarian thing. And it's not only um, in the United States, it's Bolsonaro in Brazil, it's Orban in Hungary now, wherever you see it. And, and in the book, one of the things that I do is look at it historically, and it's kind of interesting to read about the Stalin era in the, in the Soviet Union. What, what did he do? He went after the scientists because they were threats, right? And he was more than willing to send Vavilov to prison because he believed in Mendelian genetics over Lysenko, who believed in Lamarckism. And so what if it led to the death of two million peasants? This is a form of uh, authoritarian control, and, and, and that's what we're seeing. Yes? So I just had a question. Can you enlighten us a little bit about the money? Because this is funded a lot, deep money. The, the dark pieces of money that come from the drivers, and I, I can't figure out what they're getting from it. Yeah, and I've talked to even this journalist, I've asked him about this before the pandemic. I mean, yes, it's it's looking, you know, there is, they are monetizing the internet, selling the fake books on Amazon, and the nutritional supplements, and the fake autism cures, and there's pack money. But it still doesn't add up. It's kind of like, you know, the, you know, the, the the cosmologists note that most of the dark matter and dark energy of the universe is unaccounted for. It doesn't explain the acceleration of the galaxies. And it's the same with that. I mean, when you look at up all the pieces, it still doesn't add up. So I think you know we just need better investigative journalism really looking at this in more depth. I think there is a huge amount of money behind it. And, and control, and now political expediency, right? So this is. Yes. Yeah. Great talk. We uh, really appreciate you visiting with us. Um, uh, I agree. I mean, you can't prevent people saying what they're going to say. I have patients routinely choosing death over with these firm beliefs. I don't think we can overcome that. And people always, and I hate to say, control what you can control or fix what you can fix. And one thing you mentioned a couple times was the academic institutions that are supporting some of the anti science proponent uh, speakers. And I train under the, the Surgeon General in Florida, who's I'm embarrassed to even mention, and, or UCSF, for example, that are promoting people that are doing this. And so what do you advise universities that have some power to actually make a change? How could you well, work I, on that? I think there's two sides to that. One is you know, what sanctions have you done on, on faculty weaponized science and health communication? I think that's one. I think the other piece, though, is being more proactive, encouraging our fac our faculty to speak out. Um, you know, when I got my MD and PhD in New York 40 years ago, the message was you're not supposed to engage the public directly or 
or engaged journalists. That was seen as a form of self-promotion or grandstanding. And all of those ideas were put in place before something called the internet came along. And, and now there's a vacuum. And, and we're silent. We're invisible. People don't understand you know, what a scientist does on a daily basis, you know, writing grants and lab meetings and, and all this kind of stuff in the papers. And, and, and that's probably our fault because we're invisible and we're not out there. And the reason for it, partly, is university and medical academic health center offices of communication, more often than not, are very risk averse. And they really don't want their docs and scientists speaking out because all they see is risk, no benefit, right? Yep. Yeah, at the end of the day, do they really care if you talk about social justice or any science? But they really are concerned about you don't do, say anything to put the institution at risk. Or so what they'll say is, look, you're a professor, you can speak out. Um, you, you know, we can't stop you from being on Twitter or social media or talking to local news. Uh, newscasters, dot, 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 but don't screw this up. And <laughs> don't put the institution at risk. So you're always doing this with the sort of Damocles over your head. And, and what happens is you don't do it because, because you just see risk and no benefit. And, and the other problem is, and, it's, and clearly it's not courage. I mean, for instance, I get evaluated just like everybody, right? What are they asking me about? I don't see patients anymore, so they're not asking about my clinical revenue. They ask me about my grants and papers, and preferably papers on what they call high impact journals, right? There's, there's nothing there asking me about even the single author books I've written, much less you know the times I've been on CNN or MSNBC, and certainly not on social media. So the, the message they give you're given is this is not important at best, and actually is not a good thing at worst because it puts the institution at risk. So we somehow have to, and, and, and the opportunities for doctoral training, postdoctoral training, medical school training, residency training, for science communication training is zero at a lot of places, or very modest at others. So you know the, the message is not even subliminal. It's coming from the higher ups at the institution it's not a good thing to do science and health communication. And, and I, my premise is that vacuum that's been building steadily over the last few decades is what allowed all the anti-science stuff to fill that vacuum. Mm -hmm. And now we have to kind of figure out how to walk it back. Yes? Um, I was wondering if you have read anything or if you can glean from the hate mail that you received on a regular basis, the kind of age demographics of those individuals and the mindset, the fear-based, us against them mindset. And if you know we're lacking hope in the current adult population, is there hope for generations some of these behind people, us? Some of these people are incredible. They'll put their real email in the, mm -hmm. and so I could just they're send fearless. It over, I'll send it over to Houston Law Enforcement or even the ADL Anti Defamation League. Um, tends to be, uh, as a demographic, uh, looks to me more white, um, male, youngish male, you know, any, you know, under 60, um, and I would say probably lower educational uh, attainment as well. And in fact, the surveys coming out of Kaiser Family Foundation of those who are not getting their, say they're never going to get vaccinated, are pretty much that demographic. Um, and there's also maybe more rural than urban um, in many cases as well. Do you see a growth in young voices, people under 25, for example? Because those are also heavy users of social media. Yeah, I can't cut it. I, from the emails, I can't cut it that fine in terms of it. It looks to me more younger than a lot of anger, a lot of angry, more angry young middle aged men, if I have to. But, but there's a number of women as well. No question about it. Yes. Um, so, inspired negatively by the recent issue with the A beta 56 and the outright allegations of fraud in that context. Oh, um, I'm sorry. What? Uh, amyloid beta 56 and outright fraud in the context of oh, Alzheimer's disease. One. So, is it Alzheimer's disease research? A beta oligomer. 
that was recently demonstrated uh, to be a case of complete fraud by the, the authors involved. So a question that I have is, you know, are there sciences that are somewhat immune to this anti-science rhetoric? Um, to what extent does fraud in our ranks kind of contribute to the anti-science rhetoric that we're seeing? And I guess there's a bit yeah, of a problem. Yeah, I mean, any, any time there's outright, there is bona fide fraud or bona fide conflicts of interest, financial conflicts of interest reveal it all confirms the bias, right? So it certainly doesn't help, uh, no question about it. But I think even without that, we have enough there. Sure, so I mean, in, the, in that case, how do we combat that? Because I was even recently at the Alzheimer's Association meeting, and at least in the sessions that I was at, this was not addressed. And it, this was in the you know two weeks preceding these allegations came out. And I'm concerned that this will add fuel to an already very, very strongly burning fire. Yeah, um, you know, the sanctions against scientists who commit fraud obviously are pretty stiff, both in terms of, you know, reputation loss, employment loss, uh, the ability to receive NIH grants, whether we deal with that enough in a transparent manner. Uh, it, it's a long standing question that we've had for our scientific community, but you're right, I mean, it's important to get ahead of these things to keep our credibility. Fortunately, they're, they're, I think they tend to be rare, but they're very well publicized when it happens. Yes? Is it part of the problem as well, better peer review? Um, and the, you know, some of the issue with preprint, where things are coming out before they've been reviewed or assessed? I mean, yeah. Wakefield was published in the Lancet, mm -hmm. and it took years for it to be recalled and to be recalled. Yeah, that was incredible. You know, the other problem, by the way, have you ever seen in your inbox how many requests you get for reviews? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, I get, I must have seven or eight requests for reviews every day, and there, there's just not enough peer reviewers. That's a whole separate issue. Um, but it's, it's been a real problem now trying to even find journal reviewers because of that. So, you know, the benefit of preprints is at least to get some information vital to the public health community out there. So, you know, I think in, on, on, you know, in the bigger picture, I think there's no question we benefited from having preprints up in bioarchive and med archive, because otherwise, I mean, the process would just be agonizing. So I don't have an answer. There's a general problem with peer review in our scientific community. Again, maybe we need to do a better job incentivizing peer review and, and you know, maybe making this apply towards your promotion or academic advancement. Mm -hmm. That, you know, if you, you know, for every three papers you review, it counts as a paper. I, you know, I don't know what, what the formula is, the ratio is, but I think that, that could help a lot. Oh. oh, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks for that lecture. So, um, we want to know whether you have some comments on uh, using certain interventions to boost the vaccination uptake. Uh, for example, the uh, say vaccine lotteries and uh, some direct cash payment. Uh, also, maybe the mandate. Uh, you know, uh, people uh, supporters may feel that uh, it could boost the uh, vaccine uptake and uh, propagandize. Uh, 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 the correct uh, knowledge about vaccine, and where <coughs> opponents may feel that some that that intrude personal liberty and uh, uh, that's yeah, that's what this is about. I mean, we saw that you know Biden tried to push vaccine mandates through OSHA, right? That anybody, any employer that had more than a hundred employees needed to implement a vaccine mandate. Um, the red state governors quickly rallied around that and ultimately brought it to the Supreme Court. And it was a six to three judgment against the Biden administration, strictly along the partisan divide, saying no, no way. Although they did agree that healthcare facilities could put in vaccine mandates for healthcare professionals. So there was a little bit of gain there, but it was resoundingly struck down. The booster is a real problem. I mean, only 30% of Americans have gotten their first booster. I got my second booster, uh, me and six other people, right? So, I mean, it's been a real problem with 
even the second booster, even though clearly the information shows that there's enormous benefit. We are hampered, I think, a little bit by the CDC messaging that still clings to this idea that two doses is full vaccination, when we know it's not. It's not protecting against hospitalization. So, so that needs to be fixed also. I know that doesn't answer the whole question, but pieces of it. Anyway. So, if, if you, um, sorry, I've got the mic, so I'm going to go. Uh, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Um, so, the lay people aren't reading the scientific journals, they're not knowing what's going on in there. Is one of, would one of your calls for action be for us to write in the lay journals, or like write newspaper articles? I think so. I think we just need to, whatever it takes to give, to make people understand what we do because um, people don't understand what we do. I mean, before the pandemic, Research America came out with this number that you know, this vast majority of the American people could not name a living scientist. And, and of, of those who could, you know, it was Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Nye the Science Guy. And there's nothing wrong with those individuals, but they're not you know, working scientists as we know them, right? That struggle over triage grants and rejected papers or major revisions and, and the lab meetings and so they were in, and that's one of the things that I try to do when I'm on the cable news channels is try to give people a little bit of insight in, into what I do on a, on a daily basis. I think the American people like it. They want to know that scientists are real people but we're discouraged from presenting that face to us. I think anything that gets us out there in the public writing op-eds, writing commentary pieces, um, you know, going on local news channels, oh, it's all good. I mean, I think, you know, it, it, but again, it needs to be, it needs to be validated, encouraged by, now that I'm a dean, I'm a dean of sorts, small school, but you know, that we need to do a better job encouraging our faculty to, and our, our professors and our postdocs and students and make them feel good about doing this. Not always looking at it from the standpoint of, you know, are you going to put the institution at risk? Dr. Hotez, thank you very much for your talk. I really appreciated that perspective. I think I had a very similar question. Um, I recently took a course with Walter Isaacson at Tulane and he really preached a lot about the intersection between science and liberal arts. I think he saw that a lot with his book The Codebreaker uh, and Jobs and you know connecting the science to the everyday person right. I think a lot of my friends aren't reading PubMed articles on COVID. Right. I mean, he's, he's an amazing communicator. I've never I've, I wanted to, I've never met him and wanted to meet him on this visit but yeah. you know for instance. He's out of town unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, his eyes, I mean, his Einstein biography is extraordinary right now because of learning about the person. But, you know, when I started, I said, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, but it's not, it'll be sort of lightweight on the science. You know, I'm struggling to keep up. Um, you know, he really, you know, did a really good job explaining Einstein's thought process doing the science. And so he's really communicated. We need more of that. I agree that's extreme, he's an extremely powerful communicator even though quote he's not a scientist you know he's someone who really worked hard to get it right mm -hmm. so i have two quick questions yeah i spend every waking moment when i'm thinking about my research on what i think is coming our way which is long COVID and the debilitating neurologic mm -hmm. problems is there a way to uh, reframe the narrative around vaccines at least with COVID and perhaps other things Think about this long-term issue. Yeah, I mean, this is what you know the contrarian intellectuals do. They sh look at the death rates among younger people, and they use that as a way to disparage the need for getting vaccinated. And this COVID is so much more than deaths, right? I right. mean, the hospitalizations, but also the impact on long COVID that could haunt our country for years to come, and the impact on the health system. And, and you know. You know, who wants to have gray matter brain degeneration or an MRI that looks like the cognitive decline of someone 20 years older? And that's what we're facing as a country. And you know how COVID-19 has exposed every weakness in our health system, whereas I like to say we don't have a health system. The, the UK has the National Health Service. Israel has a health system. We have Amazon Pharmacy. Right? We, don't, we don't have a health system. So what are you going to do now? 
on top of all of the neurocognitive declines, um, respiratory insufficiency, cardiovascular insufficiency, and of course the depression that goes with that. Um, so we're, we're, this is going to haunt our country for a long time. What gives you hope? I get asked that every time I talk about COVID and long COVID. What gives you hope? Well, you know, I've worked my whole life on something called neglected diseases, and so, um, so I, I look for crumbs, you know. To, you know, it, 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 I think, I think these are challenging times, and I just feel blessed to be able to be talking about it, to be out there, you know, having that voice, and so I'm grateful for that as well, and the opportunity to talk to the American people on the cable news channels was was scary, but it was fantastic, but. Um, so, you know, as I say, we are a nation built on our research universities and, and, um, and, and institutions. I'll, I'll tell you one story, which was I, was I served as U.S. science envoy in the Obama administration. And so he had me out in the Middle East and North Africa in 2015, 2016. And, and in Saudi, they do these things called diwaniyas, where the men get together in the evening, over coffee and tea and discuss issues of the day, and they wanted me to speak about these delineas. And it was at a time when, um, earlier that day, Trump and his campaign stumping were just saying terrible things about Muslims, and that was all over the news. And oh crap, you know, they're going to ask me about this. And, and sure enough, they asked me about it. And the, the host saw I was starting to stumble, and he gets up, and he says, oh, Peter, don't worry about this. I know this is all bullshit, quote unquote. I did my PhD at Iowa State University. I lived with a family in Ames, Iowa for five years. I know what the real America is like. You know, boom, done, right? And so that's what said to me, you know, our research universities are probably our best ambassadors um, because everybody is international collaborations and people want, still want to come here to study. And that's what we have to focus on, as um, this is a nation of research universities and institutions. And, and what I say is, look, you know, when I get the army of patriots is coming to hunt and die, I say, look, motherfucker, we're the patriots. We're not the patriots. And, and I think we have to remember that and, and take some pride in that as well. Thank you. So I think in the interest of time, it's right around noon, we'll go ahead and thank uh, Professor Hotez for speaking.